Welcome back to Physics Fundamentals. In this video, I want to talk about heat capacity. Previously, we've talked about temperature, heat, and internal energy of an object. We've seen that these concepts are related to each other in ways that are sometimes straightforward, but also sometimes nebulous. In the concept of heat capacity, we want to get a little bit closer to an understanding of how temperature and internal energy are related to each other. So if I get my head out of the way, the heat capacity of an object we will define as the measure of the rate at which the temperature of the object changes with respect to heat flow. As we pump heat into an object, its temperature will increase. As we pull heat out of an object, its temperature will decrease. And the way that that change happens is going to depend on a couple of different quantities. So we're actually going to set this up with heat on one side of the equation and the change in temperature on the other side of the equation. And it turns out that really the two quantities that you need to worry about are the mass of the object and a property of the material, which we're going to write as Cp. and name as specific heat. So that the units here work out, we can see pretty clearly, we need to end up with joules. We need to end up with a heat measure. But we're going to multiply by a mass, so that's kilograms, and we're going to multiply by a temperature difference, so that's Celsius degrees. If we have an object undergoing a certain temperature change, we can see how much heat it is absorbing or emitting. If we have an object that is absorbing heat, we can see how its temperature is going to change just by looking things up. Our first example here, copper has a specific heat of 3.87 times 10 to the second. I guess we could have just written that as 387, but that's not how the table has it written, so that's not how I wrote it down. And we just look up the specific heat on a table for a particular material. And let's say that we have a 2.5 kilogram block of copper. And it is going to absorb, uh, I don't know, 2.25 kilojoules of heat from some high temperature object being placed on top of it. If the copper was initially at room temperature, and I'm going to define here room temperature as 18 degrees Celsius. I think I've used that phrase in other videos, um, but I do want to stress here that there is no one value for room temperature. 18 degrees Celsius and 20 degrees Celsius are both very common values. Uh, 300 Kelvin is a common value, and 72 Fahrenheit is a common value. So. Anything 
in and among that range is perfectly fine. Uh, but just saying room temperature isn't enough, we have to name the room temperature. All right, so if it was initially at room temperature, which is 18 degrees Celsius, what is its temperature now? Before I get into solving the problem, I do want to talk at least a little bit briefly about is this actually something that could happen in the world? This seems like a really strange problem because knowing the amount of heat that an object is absorbing is not really the common way that we experience the world, right? Measuring heat is a challenge. Uh, specifically, places where this sort of thing does come up are in cooling blocks. So if I have a computer that is being powered, I know that there is electric current going into the computer. That electric current is causing the computer to do its thing, the electrons to spin around in the computer, and then the energy that it uses has to be released as heat that heat has to go somewhere and very often that heat gets dissipated into some cooling apparatus. A solid block of copper that is not set up to then be vented into the air is not the best cooling device, but there are applications where airflow is problematic. Um, if you are dealing with a computer that is powering a uh, sensitive uh, measuring device or you're uh, trying to power precision engineering where airflow across the computer is going to interfere with that, then you need something like a very heavy block of copper that can just absorb a lot of heat without causing too much worry. All right, so with that idea in mind that this is something that we can actually solve, let's go ahead and set this up. We know the formula Q equals CPM delta T. We have some variables here, right? Q, CP, M, and instead of calling it delta T, I'm going to split that up and the hot temperature and the cold temperature are going to be listed separately where delta T is just the hot temperature minus the cold temperature. Our heat is 2.25 kilojoules. Since our specific heat is in joules per kilogram Celsius degree, uh, converting that, writing it as joules is probably going to save us a little bit of work later. Our heat capacity is 3.87 times 10 to the second, which I'm just going to write as 387 joules per kilogram Celsius degree. Our mass is 2.50 kilograms. Our high temperature is unknown and our low temperature is 18 degrees Celsius. That is the information that we need in order to solve. So let's go ahead and solve. couple of ways that you can go through this. I think the easiest one is let's first multiply 387 times 2.5, which gives me, I'll round it as uh, 968. Then I'll divide both sides by that 968, which gives me 2.32 equals t minus 18, and then add 18 to both sides. Um, since that seems to be given to the nearest whole degree, I'll round the result to the nearest whole degree. 
and the high temperature is 20 degrees Celsius. Given a large enough block of copper, it can absorb this much heat without even really noticing, right? The difference between 18 and 20 is the difference between the air conditioner has kicked on and you're waiting for it to kick on again. So that's the basic idea of heat transfer and specific heat. Given a material, we can do that calculation. One of the places that this can become interesting is when we have materials at different temperatures. All right. So this concept is often titled something like the method of mixtures. which I think is a more pretentious sounding title than it really deserves. But the idea here is that we have two materials that we are going to put inside of an isolating vessel. And I'm going to depict them as a solid object placed inside of a liquid bath, but it could be two liquids. It could also be two solids, but that introduces some other issues of how does the heat actually transfer between them. Right? A solid placed inside of a liquid is the optimal um, physical interface for conduction of heat. Right. But our solid is at some temperature T1, our liquid is at some other temperature T2, and if you leave these things together for a while, they're going to reach an equilibrium temperature. The method of mixtures says that we can figure out what the equilibrium temperature is going to be, by setting up the equation that the heat gained by the colder object is equal to the negative of the heat lost by the warmer object. I don't care which one is warmer and which one is colder. I might have put a, a heated piece of metal from a forge into an oil bath to cool off. I may have put a um, frozen meal from the freezer in a hot water bath to thaw. But one of them is a higher temperature and it is going to lose heat. The other one is a colder temperature and it is going to gain heat. Um, and let's just go ahead and say that the solid T1 is the higher temperature and T2 is the lower temperature. It doesn't really matter. But from here we can use the formula. Cp1 times M1 times delta T1 is equal to Cp2 M2 delta T2 and one of these has a negative on it. I'm not even worried about which one it is. I think I just set this up backwards from what I said, but that's okay. It doesn't really matter. Because when I plug in All right. So th this side is the gained. So the equilibrium temperature is the high temperature and T1 was the low temperature. And over here was heat loss, which means that T2 was the high temperature and the equilibrium was the low temperature. But then I have a negative. And if I have a negative, I can distribute it over the subtraction, which changes the order of the subtraction.
giving us a symmetric looking equation to work with. From here we can do a little bit of algebra. Uh, the details of the algebra aren't that important so I'm just going to fast forward through them. So if you care enough about the algebra, you can follow along in that derivation. If not, the important thing is that we got this formula. I do not want you to learn this formula. I do not want you to memorize this formula. I just want to point out that it is a thing we can get. Right? If we know the temperatures of the materials that went into it, and we know the properties of those materials, the specific heat and the mass, we can figure out what the equilibrium temperature is. What temperature will they come to after they rest? For the sake of time, I'm not going to go through an example of doing that calculation. Again, I just wanted to show you that this is something that we can derive. Instead, I want to press onward. To talk a little bit about latent heat. The latent heat of a material is tied to a change of phase. We've established that as an object increases in temperature, the uh, object expands. The molecules that make up that object stretch further apart. So if we start off with a solid, a material that is solid has molecules that are kind of rigidly uh, affixed to each other. They are in fixed positions. A solid is a material that has a fixed shape and volume. As the uh, molecules expand, thanks to thermal expansion, they will eventually reach a point where molecules can break free of that rigid structure and they can start moving a little bit more freely around each other. That breaking free is a change of phase as the material moves from solid to liquid. A liquid is a state in which the material still has a fixed volume, but its shape is now fluid. It can change shape to match whatever container it happens to be resting in. As thermal expansion continues, as the liquid heats up, eventually you'll reach a point where the um, Molecules of the liquid are no longer bound together. They can start freely escaping from the liquid. And that act of escape is the change of phase that brings the material from a liquid to a gas. A gas is the state in which the material no longer has a fixed volume, let alone fixed shape. Gases can be compressed to fit into a particular container. The interesting thing, and the thing that a lot of people have a misconception on, is that change of phase is a process. Right? We've established that water freezes or melts at zero degrees. Right? Liquid water taken down to zero degrees freezes and becomes ice. Solid ice at zero, uh, increases the temperature to zero degrees where it melts and becomes water. But at zero degrees, both solid ice and liquid water can coexist. It takes energy to make that transition from solid to liquid. It releases energy to make that transition from liquid to solid. We call the energy required to make that transition the latent heat. And specifically at the solid liquid boundary, we call it the latent heat of fusion, generally notated as LF. And for water, the latent heat of fusion 
is 335 kilojoules per kilogram. Between liquid and gas, we call this the latent heat of vaporization. LV, and again for water, it is uh, 2.26 megajoules per kilogram. All right, getting water from solid to liquid doesn't take that much energy. Uh, getting water from liquid to gas takes a lot of energy. If I combine this with some information about the specific heat of water, and I do want to point out here that the specific heat of water in solid, liquid, and gas states are all different. But with this information, we can start looking at long term. What happens if we try to put a block of ice on the stove? So on the vertical scale here, we have temperature. On the horizontal axis, we have heat in kilojoules. And what I want you to imagine is we're going to take a one kilogram block of ice and we're going to put it on a hot plate. This block of ice is initially going to be at a temperature of negative 20 degrees Celsius. And at that point, we have not yet added any heat. As we add heat, we will eventually increase the temperature from negative 20 to zero. We can use the specific heat of ice, which was right here off the screen, 2.09 times 10 to the third joule per kilogram de uh, Celsius degree. All right, so that's two kilograms or two kilojoules per kilogram per degree. We have one kilogram, we have 20 degrees. So all told that's coming out at something like uh, 40 kilojoules. Punching that into my calculator, I'm not writing out the equations because I can't show them on the screen at the same time. <coughs> Excuse me. But writing out that formula using this uh, specific heat that we have we get that that comes up at uh, 42 kilojoules. Now that we have gotten the ice to zero degrees, it is still ice. We have to add more heat in order to melt the ice. The heat we need to add is the latent heat of fusion, 335 kilogram, kilojoules per kilogram. We have one kilogram, so that's 335 kilojoules we need to add. Add that to the 42 kilojoules we have already added. And that's going to take us over here to 377 kilojoules. All right, so up until that point, we have ice. Once we reach that point, we now have water. But our water is on the stove, which means that we are going to increase its temperature as we add more heat. This is very much not drawn to scale at this point, but eventually here we're going to end up at 100 degrees Celsius. We know it takes 4.19 uh, kilojoules to increase the temperature of one kilogram by one Celsius degree. Multiply that by the 100 degrees we have to go, and that's 419 kilo, uh, kilojoules. Add that to the 377 we already have, and we are now going to be at 796 
kilojoules added. But again, at this point, we are still liquid water. We are liquid water at 100 degrees, but still liquid water. We then have to add more heat. How much more heat? Well, that's the latent heat of vaporization, 2.26 megajoules, 2,000 kilojoules to the 700 we already have. Eventually, still at 100 degrees, we're going to reach, uh, what does that come out to? 3,056 is what my notes say. Kilojoules that we have added, and only at that point do we turn to steam, and then from there we can keep heating up if we would like, but at that point we have probably escaped the freezer. So, in practice, you have probably never seen this. First of all, I don't think anyone taking this course will have ever thought that it might be a good idea to take a block of ice and put it on the stove in order to boil it. That's just not how you deal with ice, right? If you need to boil water, you get it from the tap so it already starts warmer, and you can save yourself this much of the energy. You've also probably noticed that the phase change doesn't happen all at once. Right? If you have watched a pot of boiling water, you have a pot of water. It's all liquid and it's all at 100 degrees. And then there's bubbles that pop up and those bubbles are uh, steam, water vapor, escaping. Well, that's because the heat isn't distributed instantaneously, right? The heat transfer. You have the pot sitting on the burner, which is conducting heat into the pot, which causes the water at the bottom of the pot to reach higher temperatures and to absorb more heat. And then using convection, that heat gets spread around through the pot. But the most heat is at the bottom of the pot, so the water at the bottom of the pot reaches a boil and then bubbles up through the rest of the pot. The water at the top of the pot is, maybe it's already at 100, maybe it's only at 99, 98, but the circulation of the water will bring that down so it can warm up, it can reach temperature, it can absorb the extra heat to get steam, right? You don't keep a uniform heat added to every single molecule of the ice as you go through this process. The outer parts melt and start to boil before the center of the block of ice has even realized that there is heat being added. All right. I think that's enough for one video, so I'll wrap up with that. As always, thank you for joining me. I'll see you next time.